From the Mutual Studios in Washington, I'm Fulton Lewis, and that's the top of the news as it looks from here. G. Marshall, and I have a ghost story to tell you, but a most unusual ghost story, since it violates all the established rules. You know the rules for a ghost story. It must be set on some desolate, windswept moor, or perhaps in a ruined, isolated mansion, or a lonely, deserted castle. However, this spine-tingling tale actually takes place in a modern, luxury, high-rise apartment building, and... In broad daylight. I don't want to die, George. Please. I don't want to die. Margaret, darling, listen to me. No. No. Margaret, it would be better. Better for who? For you, dear. For you. I have very little left, George. Please, just let me live a little longer. Margaret, life means nothing to you now. I know, but just let me live a little bit longer. I can't, Margaret. I can't. Our mystery drama, The Man Who Heard Voices, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Larry Haynes. It is sponsored in part by the Kellogg Company, makers of Kellogg's Special K cereal. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Hi, son. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hi, Junior. Kellogg's Special K presents... Junior gives up. Junior, why aren't you eating your special K? It's your favorite cereal. Oh, just because. Just because why, honey? Just because Darla said some evil things about it. That's just because why. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Hi, Hi Darla. Darla. Hi, sis. Hi, Junior. Darla, what did you tell Junior about his special K? Daddy, all I told him was that special K is good for him. Yeah, and anything that's good for me never seems to taste good. But, Junior, you already know that special K tastes good. Who do I believe? Darla or my taste buds? Uh, what's that, son? Oh, nothing, Dad. Uh, son, special K is American. America's favorite high-protein cereal. It's got minerals, vitamins, iron, and all those good, nutritious things. But it got to be so popular over the years because it tastes good, too. You mean it's good for me and tastes good, too. Right, son. Right, Dad. Right, Junior. Right, Mom. Right, Dad. <laughs> right, indeed. Start your balanced breakfast with Kellogg's Special K. It's nutritious and delicious. Right, Dad. This is WOR New York, your station for the Mystery Theater. <laughs> No matter what you're saving for, that's what suburban savings for suburban. Suburban Savings offers you a regular savings account with flexibility. You can add any amount to your account whenever you wish. Withdraw whenever you want. Suburban Savings pays a 5.25% annual interest rate on regular savings paid quarterly, which earns an annual effective yield of 5.47%. Interest is compounded continuously from day of deposit to day of withdrawal, as long as $50 is maintained in the account to the end of the quarter. Come into Suburban Savings and open an account with flexibility. Our regular savings account in New Jersey at Bayonne, Edgewater, Elmwood Park, Emerson, Hackettstown, Morris Plains, Nutley, Paramus, and Sparta. At 42, George Wesley Sanderson is handsome, intelligent, and wealthy. He is married to a most beautiful woman. He is a partner in a prestigious law firm. He has a host of friends because he is gracious, considerate, sensitive, and obliging. And so, you look at him sipping his morning coffee in his luxurious apartment in New York City, and you say to yourself, here indeed is one of fortune's favorites. How wonderful life must be for George Wesley Sanderson. But we have invaded his privacy. We have caught him alone and off guard. And so we see a look of terror in his eyes. And no wonder, because George Wesley Sanderson hears a voice. A woman's voice. It's time for my pills, George. The voice is clear and distinct. May I have my pills, George? 
But George is alone in the room. My pills. George? Not only is George Wesley Sanderson alone in the room, but the voice belongs to a woman ten years dead. Margaret. Margaret. George, you must give me my pills. Oh, no, no, no. George. Yes, yes, I'm, uh, I'm here, Sally. We all decided that you should be down here. Well, I, uh... Well, you what? Are you all right, George? Yes, yeah, yes, I'm fine. Good. Get on the plane. Well, well, darling, somebody has to work. Oh, come on. That silly place runs itself. Goodbye, dear. Georgie, are you sure you're all right? Yeah, yes, yes, I'm, I'm fine. And, uh, really, I, I have to get to the office. I notice you'd rather get to the office than fly to me. Darling, it's not what I'd rather do. It's what I have to do. My next husband will be a man with absolutely no ethics at all. Goodbye. My name, as you know, is George Wesley Sanderson. And I must talk to somebody, unburden myself, but there is nobody. Oh, my wife loves me. My father-in-law is most understanding. I have good friends. I could confess to a priest... Is it a psychiatrist? But you see, each in his own way would fail me because no one would accept the basic point of my problem. No one would ever believe that... that I'm a man who hears voices. There are times when I can hear what people think, what they're going to think. And there are times when I can hear people who are miles away or... or even dead. It started, oh, 15 years ago. I was married to my first wife then. Her name was Margaret. She was 23 years old, vivacious, active, loved sports. She could even beat me in tennis, but she did it with such charm, I didn't mind it a bit. That's out. Oh, that looked in to me. Okay. <laughs> if you want the point, you can have the point. You should have a handicap anyhow. Okay. Just look out for this ace. <laughs> huh, an ace. How'd you like that, huh? I say, how'd you like that? Margaret? Margaret, is something wrong? No. I'm fine. Well, you had a funny look on your face. Did I? It's just... Just what? Nothing, nothing. I... I, I just had a funny little twinge in my back. But it's gone now. Your serve. Then and there, I heard a voice. It was the voice of our doctor. You both should know the truth. We don't know what's wrong with Margaret. She won't be able to walk. She'll have to stay in bed. For a while, anyway. These pills will keep her alive. Exactly one year later, the doctor spoke those very words to us in the hospital. Sent for me, Mr. Cartwright? Yes, George, sit down. Thank you, sir. George, I, uh, I read your brief on the Hollingsworth case. Brilliant. Is that what you'd like to specialize in? Criminal law? Yes, sir. Good. This firm could use a crackerjack trial lawyer. Uh, let's have dinner one night this week and start making some plans for you. Well, sir, I, uh, really can't go out much at night. You know? No, you see, uh, my, my wife is, uh, bedridden. Oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, we uh, we don't even know what it is. One of those uh, mysterious ailments. Anyhow, she uh, has to have constant attention. I have a woman who stays with her during the day, but at night I can't leave her alone. Hmm. Well, that's too bad. We'll arrange for lunch, perhaps. Then I heard his voice. His silent voice. But to me, it was crystal clear. George, it's a tragedy. But if he 
wants to be an eight-hour-a-day man, he'll remain in an eight-hour-a-day job. That's, uh, that's all for now, George. I just wanted to let you know how pleased I am with your work. And the other partners are, too. Well, thank you, sir. Hi, Dad. Your secretary said you were busy, but I'll only be a minute. <laughs> well, hello. Who is this? Uh, this is one of our new young attorneys, George Wesley Sanderson, and my daughter Sally. How do you do? George Wesley Sanderson. Even sounds like a great lawyer. <laughs> now, dear, save that ravishing smile for where it'll do you some good. George Sanderson is a married man. And once again, I heard a voice. Sally's voice. I don't care if he is married. I want him. I never believed it, but now I know it's absolutely true. There is such a thing as love at first sight. I love him. Oh, thank you, dear. But I don't want any more. It's time for my pill. Oh, yes, so it is. I'll, uh, I'll get it for you. Those pills, they're like a lifeline. Well, let's be thankful they work. Oh, poor George. You've become a full-time nurse. And in addition, you've got a full-time job. You really don't get much sleep, darling. You have to set an alarm every two hours to give me my pill. Darling, we stood up together and we took a vow for richer, for poorer, for better, for worse, in sickness and health. Till death do us part. Let's, uh, change the subject, huh? Okay. Well, how'd it go at work today? Oh, uh, everybody flipped for the way I handled the Hollingsworth case. Oh, will it mean a promotion? Well, maybe, but more important is the additional money. Oh, George. Now what? If you become important, we'll be expected to entertain Oh, no, and... no, nothing of the sort. I'm going to run my business the way I want I intend to do my work during the day, in the office. I don't have to socialize with people. Merit. Ability. That's what should count. And for the third time that day, I heard a voice. This time, Margaret's. Oh, Lord. I want to live. I'm not much use. I can't do a thing. I'm a drag of a man I love. I'm good for absolutely nothing. But I want to live. And we have a clear precedent here. When Theodore Roosevelt was uh, police commissioner of the city of New York, the question of injury incurred while making a citizen's arrest... Do you always uh, talk to yourself? Oh, I happen to be dictating into this recording. How did you get in here? <laughs> Being the boss's daughter ought to give a girl certain privileges. I came by hoping you might have pity on me. Pity? I'm famished. You might take me to lunch. Well, uh... Well, what? It wouldn't hurt you with the chief. Might even pave the way to a promotion. Well, on the other hand, it might backfire. How? Well, how does your father regard married male employees who take his daughter to lunch? I don't know. It's never happened before. As you legal types might say, there are no precedents. Come on. Take a chance. Live dangerously. I'll give my hat. <laughs> Darling, I'm sorry. I uh, need my pill. No, it's okay. It's okay, darling. Here you are, dear. Thank you. There. Now, just uh, let me set the alarm again. You must be exhausted. No, 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 not really. Are you uh, feeling any better? Yes, a little. I was so tired when you came home, though, we couldn't even talk. And I look forward to our talk so much. Anything interesting happened today? Uh, no, no, just a lot of routine. What did you have for lunch? Lunch. Uh, lunch, let's see, uh, I just had a sandwich at the desk. Oh, George, you should go out. No, no, dear, no, I shouldn't. <laughs> I did. She would drop by two, three times a week. And it just became, well, a 
a thing we did. We were friends, that's all. I knew she was in love with me, but I was discovering something else. Something very unsettling, very disturbing. I was falling in love with her, too. I tried to fight it. Hop out right here. Okay. There. Well, now that uh, we've scared away every fish between here and Europe... <laughs> I wouldn't know what to do with a fish if I caught one. Well, uh, let's just drift for a bit, huh? Oh, you didn't have to say that. Say what? Drift. Haven't we been doing just that since the day we met? Yes, yes, I suppose we have. What are we going to do, George? I, uh, I don't know. I'm willing to settle. Settle? For half a loaf. Oh, no, 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 that, that wouldn't work. After a while, you'd get to hate me. No, George, I wouldn't. Well, I'd hate myself. Do you still love her? No. No, it's a terrible thing, but I... I don't love her anymore. You know, that happens to people. Just as they can fall in love, they can also fall out of love. It's, it's just that the timing and the circumstances are bad for Margaret and for me. But if you no longer love her... Well, how could I ever divorce her? Hey, hey, where are we going? I don't know. But the one thing I can't do is just to stand still. Nothing and no one in this world ever really stands still. Wheels are always turning. Gears are shifting. Minds are changing. Perhaps slowly, imperceptibly, subtly. Even a marriage vow contains the seeds of its own dissolution. For it says, Until death do us part. We'll be back shortly with Act Two. Thank you, thank you. More than 75,000 letters and they're still coming in. I am High Brown, producer of Radio Mystery Theater. You've said such beautiful things, like bravo, 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 a breath of fresh air, and superb production. I love you, but there's one problem. So many of you ask questions, it's going to take weeks sorting through all that mail to give you an answer. So if you need a quick reply to a specific question, please write again, and we'll try to answer promptly. Write Mystery Theater, Box 5152, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. That's Mystery Theater, Box 5152, Radio City Station, New York, 10019. And please do keep listening. We hope Radio Mystery Theater is here to stay. W.O.R. New York, your mystery theater station. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? Hey, Ma, what you got? Hey, Ma, will it be much longer? My hunger's getting stronger and I can't wait. She loves her family. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets shop right do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? Hey, Ma, what you got? Here's a dinner suggestion from your ShopRite supermarket. Grade A rock Cornish hens, just 59 cents a pound. U.S. number one Idaho baking potatoes, five pounds for 79 cents. And for dessert, Flavor King ice cream, half gallon, 69 cents. She wants the best. She does all that she can do. She lets ShopRite do the rest. Hey, Ma, what's for dinner? ShopRite has the answer. George Wesley Sanderson is in a motorboat just off Long Island on a beautiful day with a beautiful woman who loves him. And to make it perfect, he also loves her. However, there's a complication. George Wesley Sanderson is married, and he takes his vow seriously. We'll do something, Sally. You'll have to do something, George. People don't stand still. Yes, I know. You can't freeze a relationship. It grows better every day or it becomes worse. 
you fall in love because another person has something you need. And sometimes it's the terrible truth. When that person loses what attracted you in the first place, love also goes with it. I know, I know. So many people can't face up to it. They're unable to end a thing that really no longer exists. I love you, Sally. I love you, George, but I'm human. If I can't have you, sooner or later, I'll face it, and then I'll make other arrangements for my life. Sally, wait for me. Oh, I'll wait, George. But I can't promise to wait forever. Just then I heard another voice. It was a voice I'd never heard before, but there was no, no mistaking who it could be and what the meaning was. And do you, George, take Sally for your lawful wedded wife to have and to hold? Oh, Sally, darling, don't ask me how or when or why. But... <laughs> George, look out. You'll upset the boat. Who cares, Sally? It's going to happen. <laughs> What's going to happen? You and me, we're going to happen. We're going to be married. But... No buts. Just believe me. I believe you, George. I believe you. Mm, that was good. I was so hungry. Well, Margaret, that's a good sign. Oh, I don't know. Sometimes I just wish... What? What do you wish? Oh, nothing, nothing. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Well, now, you must have had an interesting morning. Oh, just so-so. Well, what was it? What did you have to do at the office? You never did tell me. No, no, I didn't. Well, uh, we had to take a deposition. Oh? And uh, we just spent the morning listening to witnesses. And, uh... Margaret? Margaret? What? Oh, dear, what is it, George? Don't close your eyes yet. Time for your pill. Here, take it down with some juice. Oh. You know, that's all we'd have to do, just forget one pill. Oh, George. Darling. Maybe we'd both be better off. Hey, good morning, George. What is it? Yeah, sit down. Thank you. Now, George, I, uh... I want you to go to Washington. I know you have personal problems. Yes, sir. I want you to argue the Stillwell case before the Court of Appeals. Well, sir, You I... can win this case for us. You're a natural. Lawyers like you come along once in a generation. Yes, but, Mr. Cartwright... The trial date is in six weeks. Now, I'm sure you can find a way to, uh, resolve your problem. You can buy nursing care while you're gone. Sir, it's more than that. I'm sure it is. Now, I don't want to intrude in your personal affairs. Although I understand I'm indirectly affected. My daughter, evidently, is uh, quite taken with you. Well, that's between the two of you. I assure you. Of what? The two of you are in love. It's a very difficult situation. But it's your situation... For my part, I need you for the Stillwell trial in Washington. Now, don't don't give me your answer right now. And then I heard a voice. And this voice I knew very well because it was my own voice. And I could hear myself say... If it please the court, the prosecution claims that the defendant at the Stillwell has committed the crime of high treason against the government of the United States. George? Mm -mm. George! Oh, what, what, what? Well, that's what I want to ask you. What happened? You turned pale. Is, uh, is everything all right? Oh, y yes, sir. Yes, sir, everything's fine. Just fine. I, uh, I mean, I, I, I believe that I will be able to plead the Stillwell case after all. Has she been taking these pills regularly? Oh, religiously, Doctor. The woman we have here in the daytime is absolutely trustworthy, and of course I'm here all night. And he's a tyrant about it, Doctor. Well, he should be. Uh, Doctor, what about Margaret? Well, for the first time since... since this thing struck, I have good news. Uh, 
Good news. I, I say good. These words, good and bad, are relative. Yes, but what do you mean by good? Well, for the first time, I can detect no further signs of deterioration. I see. Uh, unless some other complication occurs. Margaret can live on indefinitely, provided she takes her pills on a regular basis. Oh, we'll, we'll see to that, Doctor. We'll see to that. Well, uh, keep in touch if anything unusual happens, and I'll be here again next week. Yes, I'll uh, see you to the door, Doctor. Goodbye, Margaret. Goodbye, Doctor. Oh, a lovely day, isn't it, George? Uh, yes, yes. Oh, uh, about those pills, George. Make sure you never run out. And she must have one every two hours. That's what his speaking voice was saying to me. The little amenities, the weather, don't forget her pills, and so on. But there was another voice. His inner voice. And I could hear it so clearly, so plainly. Poor kids. I'm glad I don't have to decide. She's in such terrible pain. Constantly. Well, that's between the two of them. Or maybe it's up to him. I only know I wouldn't want to be in his shoes for all the money in the world. Goodbye, George. Goodbye, Doctor, and uh, thank you for everything. George? George? Oh, uh, yes, dear. I'd like a pillow. Yes, dear, I'm coming. Here we are. Now, mm. does that feel more comfortable? Mm-hmm, I think so. Margaret, look at me. I'm looking at you, darling. <laughs> I wanted to hear her voice. Not her speaking voice, but her thinking voice. Her feeling voice. The way I'd heard it once before. But this... This ability, this this gift, this talent, call it what you will, doesn't work at my command. It comes and goes of its own accord. I wanted to know how she felt, what she really wished for. If a certain decision was to be made, I wanted her to share in it. But try as I might, I, I simply couldn't hear her inner voice. And I knew that... The decision, one way or another, would have to be mine. All mine, mine alone. I'm looking at you, darling. Margaret, are you in pain? Oh, doesn't matter, really. The pill takes care of it. Oh, it's such a miraculous pill. It takes care of everything. Oh, I think I'd better sleep for a while, George. I, I, I just want to sleep. Margaret, what do you mean? Please tell me, what do, you, what do you mean by by sleep? Margaret? Oh, I'll get that. Uh, hello? George? Oh, yes, Mr. Cartwright. Hey, can you arrange to fly to Washington a week from Friday? Uh, a week from Friday? Yes, for a pre-trial on the Stillwell case. Well, sir, I hadn't expected well, to... Well, uh, you told me just yesterday in the office that you'd handle it. Well, yes, sir, but that was uh, because I, I, I thought I had six more weeks. Well, you do. This will just involve you down there for a day or two this time. I understand. I'll have Miss Gordon book your flight. Well, uh, a week from Friday, that's uh, that's about ten days, isn't it? Yeah, well, we'll have all the papers for you at the office tomorrow. And I'm taking you off everything else. Just remember, we want this case. Yes, sir. Goodbye, George. Goodbye, sir. George? Mm, oh. Oh, darling, I thought you were asleep. <laughs> the ringing of the phone woke me. I thought it was the alarm for my pill. Oh, no, no. We still have another hour for that. Now, what's supposed to happen a week from Friday? Hmm? Oh, oh, uh, just a lunch date with Mr. Cartwright and uh, a client. He must like you a lot, doesn't he? Well, I'm not really a bad lawyer. <laughs> oh, George. I wish I could be of help to you. I wish there was something I could do. Here I am, George. Oh, hi. I'm sorry I'm late. Dad tells me how busy you are. I ordered you your extra dry gimlet. Thanks. I could use it. Dad also tells me you're going to Washington. Yes. Uh, that is, I think so. You think so? I understand the plans are all set. Well, the fact is, I uh, know I'll be going, but... Uh... But what? Oh, nothing. Once the trial begins, there's no telling how long it may run. These government things can go on for months. Yes, I know. How about... How about Margaret? 
Yes, Margaret. Let's not talk about Margaret. But, George... Please. I said I'd be satisfied with half a loaf. Right now, I don't want to talk about it. But, George, I'm in time. There are things I must decide. I want to help no, you. No, no, no. But when people are in love, there should be no barriers. Nothing held back. Sally. Sally, you have a lot to learn about love. George, I won't be spoken Please, to. Please, Sally, that. don't press me. Don't push me, huh? I don't care who you are, how deeply you love. There are certain things I must decide on my own. George Wesley Sanderson is faced with a decision. And it's a decision a man doesn't make lightly. Nor does he make it every day. Because what George must decide is whether or not to kill his wife. We shall return shortly with Act Three. Ever had a tall, frosty glass of amplitude? Well, if your beer is Budweiser, you've had it often. Amplitude is a fancy word for the entire taste phenomenon, the total experience of flavor. Next time you take a healthy swallow of Bud, watch what happens. Think about the sensations you're experiencing. Notice how the flavor of Bud comes on nice and easy. Not too strong, not too quick, just right. Notice the clean, crisp togetherness of Bud's taste. Everything in perfect balance, with no single element jumping out at you. And there'll be no aftertaste either, no hanging on. And you'll be refreshed and ready for another glassful. Actually, Bud drinkers have been experiencing amplitude for years. But they never phrase it that way. They just say, Budweiser. And that says it all. Anheuser-Busch. St. Louis. W.O.R. New York, your station for the Mystery Theater. Vacancy decontrol in New York. You've heard about it, haven't you? Tonight you'll hear more about it on WOR, on the Wingate News Digest, 10 o'clock. I'm going to take a microphone and talk to a man who rents apartments. He's a real estate agent. And oddly enough, he is very much on the side of tenants. He says you can take an apartment that had been rented for $250, you move out, and if you can get it, fine. You've got $500 a month. What's it doing? Driving young people, old people, out of the city, he says. That has got to be repealed. Also, a visit with Oscar the Butcher in Sheepshead Bay in Brooklyn. He says you keep hearing from government officials that the cost of beef is going down, and he's going out of business because it's so high he can't charge his customers that much. John Wingate, tonight, 10 o'clock, WOR. It is one minute before two in the morning in the apartment of George Wesley Sanderson. An alarm clock is set to go off exactly on the hour. It must awaken George so that he can give his wife, Margaret, a pill. A pill she takes every two hours. Without her regular pill, Margaret will die. George? George, wake up. Mm. George? Oh, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Oh, I was afraid for a minute that the clock wouldn't wake you. Yes, I'm sorry. I was sleeping pretty soundly. Poor George, you never get any rest. No, it's all right. It's all right. Here, darling, take your pill. Oh. Thank you, darling. Thank you. And now go go back to sleep. Well, I uh, better reset the alarm. You're so good to me, George. There. There it is. I've set it for four. Good night, darling. Good night. I turned to look at her. Her eyes were closed. She was only 28. But her face was lined. Her skin was drawn and flushed, and she looked old. Old. Where was the pert, vivacious Margaret who only a few months before had been bursting with life? Wasn't she as good or as bad as dead already? Wasn't it a mercy to end her suffering? Wasn't her living merely a sham and a pretense? Suppose I, I would somehow forget to give her the next pill. What would I be ending? And then once again I heard the voices. But these were voices from the past. 
the recent past. This firm could use a cracker jack criminal lawyer. I love you, George. I love you. We have plans for you. I'll wait for you, darling. But I can't promise to wait forever. We're all pleased with your work. Why hold on to a relationship that no longer exists? I can't do it. I'm absolutely useless, but I want to live. I want to live. George? George, the alarm. George, wake up. George, it's time for my pill. George, wake up. You must wake up. George? Wake up. Please, Margaret, I'm doing it for you. George. George, I must have my pills. George, wake up. Oh, believe me, Margaret. Please believe me. It isn't Sally or the job. I admit they both kept me, but I don't want to see you suffer anymore. Aren't you going to give me my pills? George? Let me live. Just a little longer, please. And I'm... George, please. So mixed up. George, don't pretend to be asleep. I'm doing it for you, Margaret. Maybe for me, too, but mostly for you. Oh, George. Darling. I forgive you. I forgive you. Sit down, George. Sit down. Now, you didn't have to come into the office today. Yes, I know, sir, but she's been dead a week, and, uh, well, things go on. I'm due to leave for Washington tomorrow. Yes, uh, we, uh, well, we wondered whether under the circumstances to ask for a delay. Well, there's no point to that, sir. What I need now is lots of work. Well, <laughs> we have lots of work around here. George... I've been trying to reach you to tell you how sorry... Sally, it's all right. Now, there is a possibility that you people have something to discuss. Excuse me for a moment. Well, Sally. Here we are. Yes. How did it happen, George? Oh, it's something that could have happened at any time. She just, uh, fell asleep and, uh... And she didn't wake up. And now what, George? And now... We can be married. That is, if you'll still have me. Oh, darling. I have to go to Washington. I'll go with you. And you know, of course, what Dad's been talking about. Well, actually, I don't. Well, we're fairly direct people, all of us. Dad was saying that since you and I would be married, there'd be a partnership in the firm as well. Mm-hmm. Well, as long as we're fairly direct people, I may as well tell you that I deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> Darling, do you know that this is the first time I've ever seen you smile? Oh, I smile all the time. You listen to me, George Wesley Sanderson. You're going to live. You're going to travel. You're going to mingle with all the people worth knowing in government, politics, the theater, art. Wait, wait, wait. Now, when do I work? Oh, you can work as hard as you like. As long as you remember, you have to play hard, too. When do we start? Right now. That was, uh, what, 15 years ago? I was 30, she was 25. And the years haven't changed either of us. Well, not very much, anyhow. Life has been full of excitement, zest, and, of course, satisfaction. Because I've won some very well-publicized cases in this talk of a judgeship, but that's all for the future. The important thing is that for almost 15 years since she died, I haven't heard voices. You know, those voices. Until... Until last week. And it happened when I was alone in the morning at breakfast. May I have my pills, George? My pills. I want to live. Please, George. My pills. <laughs> And 
And I've kept hearing them. I don't know what to make of it, because after all, she did say she's forgiven me. Why should I hear her now? Why? I don't understand it. Why now? In the case of delay versus international power, the precedent is clearly stated. Sally. Sally, what are you doing here? I'm here to tell you about a precedent which is going to be established right now. Well, I thought you were in London. I was, and then I decided to come back here for some litigation. Litigation? With whom? With you. Oh? What, uh, what kind of litigation? I want to review the basis for our marriage. It is rooted in the factors of common interests. We're both alive. We like to do things, go places. Do you agree? Sure. So why aren't we going and doing? Well, we, uh... Well, we what? Do you realize that for the past year you've been working day and night? Well, darling, it so happens we have some crucial cases. Do you want our relationship to change permanently? Do you want us to drift apart? Do you know you're a nut? Darling, a long time ago we talked about this. Nothing. No one ever stands still. People change. And if they do, so does the basis of their relationship. All right. We'll go skiing. Turn your work over to the bright young eager beavers and let's you and I start having fun again. And we did. We traveled, we played, we danced, we enjoyed ourselves. And I even managed to get some good work done, too. We were never so happy. There was, of course, one small dark cloud for me. I could hear Margaret's voice. I need my pills, George. Aren't you going to give me my pills? Please? Penny, for your thoughts, George. Mm. Oh, well, you couldn't buy my high-priced thoughts for a penny. You seem to be in a state of reverie. I was? As if you were listening to something. Oh, must be your imagination. As if you were listening to voices. Voices, are you sure you're all right? Positively spooky. Spooky? Here in our apartment in the bright sunlight? Oh, no, you've got to look for your spooks in the dead of night. Well, I know what we both need. All right, tell me. A good hard hour of tennis. Oh, now, darling, I have to be at the office. You don't have to be anywhere except with me. Okay, you're on for one hour. Ha! Ha! That's out. <laughs> this set has one more game. Your luck won't hold forever. Oh, no, I don't need luck. I happen to be good. <laughs> oh, that was definitely out. Uh, I think I'm going to break your uh, service. Uh, uh, well? Uh, George, what's the matter? It's nothing, dear. Well, I'm waiting, sir. Oh. Uh, uh, what is it, George? Is uh, something wrong? No, 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 I'm fine. But you have a funny look on your face. Have I? Are you sure you're all right, yes, dear? Yes, yes, I'm sure. It's, it's, it's just... Just what? Oh, it's nothing. I, uh... I just had this little twinge in my back. But it, it's gone now. But it wasn't gone. It wasn't much, but it didn't go away. And so that afternoon, instead of going to the office, I went to the doctor. I can't see anything. Could be a muscle strain. Uh, try a little heat at home. If it persists, we'll give you some physiotherapy. Doctor, it's uh, nothing serious, would you say? Well, right now it doesn't look serious. I looked very hard at the doctor. I tried to listen for another voice. His inner voice. Perhaps, perhaps a voice he didn't even know he had. The voice I'd heard 15 years before with Margaret when he predicted. But no, there was nothing. I sighed with relief. Pour me a cup of black coffee. Yeah, sure thing. How's the back this morning? Oh, fine, just fine. How about some Janet's? If you'd like. Sure your back's okay? I said so, honey. I found out you'd seen the doctor the other day. Oh, well, it was uh, just a checkup. And the back? Oh, a twinge now and then. Oh, everybody gets a twinge now and then. Dinner tonight at the Caswells. I better call her. And then we'll try a few sets. 
Do you love me? I think so. I think I love you, too. She left the room. I was all alone. For a week now, I've been hearing Margaret's voice. But now there wasn't a sound. I listened. But as mysteriously as it had begun, perhaps it was coming to an end. Maybe I was losing this... this ear I had for voices. And then I heard it. A voice. It was very indistinct at first, but I recognized it. It was my own voice. But I couldn't believe what it was saying. I didn't want to believe what it was saying. Sally. Oh, please, Sally. Sally, give me my pills. Please. Sally, I, I must have my pills. Sally, aren't you going to give me my pills? Sally, don't kill me. I don't want to die. Sally, my pills. George. George, what's wrong? Sally. Sally, it's my back. I'll call the doctor. Yes, Sally, quickly. The pain is terrible. Sally, please. You won't kill me, will you? What are you talking about? When, when the time comes, you won't kill me. You won't, you won't, Sally. Or will you? Will you? Who knows? George and Margaret, that's one story. George and Sally, that's another. Yes, we often think, many of us, how wonderful if we could only hear voices from the future. Voices that could predict our fate. But maybe it's not such a good idea after all. Maybe it's better never to know. I'll be back in a moment. And now, with another story of mystery and intrigue, here is Commander Neville Putney to keep you in... Anxiety. What's this story about, Commander? Well, it concerns a middle-aged business executive named Fremont Witherton, who, after spending his entire career with the same firm, returned home one evening with his dreams suddenly shattered. Is that you, Fremont? It's me, Erica. Fremont, you look so peaked. Erica, I've been fired. That new plant manager, he's been trying to cut me out, and today he succeeded. Well, you don't need to give me that hangdog look. Just go out and get another job. I'm through, Erica. I'm 58 years old. Nobody will hire me for half the salary I've been making. My only hope is to kill the plant manager. Fremont, I hate rough stuff, but if you've decided, your Ross goes upstairs in the trunk. You load it, and I'll warm up the getaway car. Hey, young man, how about that for a story? Well, that was a dilly, Commander, but you just can't leave us this way. How did it all come out? Time's up for now, but tune in, Bob and Ray, on WOR 315 to 7, and maybe you'll find out. This is WOR New York, your station for the Mystery Theater. This is Mary Helen McPhillips. I hope you'll join me tomorrow morning at 10.15 on the Martha Dean program. My guest will be John Alexander McMahon. He's president of the American Hospital Association, and we'll be talking about the cost, quality, and quantity of health care, a concern to all of us. That's tomorrow morning at 10.15. What are the voices we think we hear in the night? Are they merely dreams, fantasies, or our own wishes? Or are they real? And why shouldn't they be real? After all, reality is what we think it is, and ever so often, what we want it to be. One reality that you can count on is the absolute fact that we will be back here again with other voices to tell you another tale that will excite and amaze and perhaps cause just a tiny, delicious tingle of terror. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Augusta Dabney, Leon Janney, and Suzanne Grossman. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. I want a baby. Get on with whatever you have to do. First of all, this talisman. You must wear it around your waist. This package contains herbs. A special combination to relax you. That's the secret. To relax. That's all. For now. But one thing I must add. On the birth of the child, I will ask you one favor. You must promise to grant it. Take the talisman and the herbs. And don't be alarmed if... 
certain unusual things happen in the next few weeks. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. WOR Mystery Theater was brought to you by ShopRite Supermarkets, where you get a lot more for a little less, and by Suburban Savings with offices throughout North Jersey. The preceding Mystery Theater program was furnished by the CBS Radio Network. Now, let's listen to a few moments from tomorrow night's suspenseful drama on the WOR Radio Mystery Theater. But one thing I must add about our arrangement. Yes, on the birth of the child, I will demand one favor. You must promise to grant it. A favor? What? I shall ask it when the child is born. But I can't promise that when I don't know what it is. It's a very small favor, but it is part of the bargain. And believe me, Mrs. Richards, if you do decide to bargain with me, I warn you to be ready to keep your part of it. Mother Love stars Joan Hackett. Hear the entire exciting drama tomorrow night, right after the Fulton Lewis News commentary at 7 o'clock.